Luckily for us, this time the rhino just seemed curious. Having seen these two-ton panel beaters at work and hearing what they could do to a Land Rover, I was a bit surprised when Ted stopped the car and we set off on foot. But Ted knows most of these rhinos individually. He's lived amongst them for so long, we knew we could trust him. With its massive bulk and huge horn, it's hard to know what a rhino actually needs to defend itself against. An adult rhino is probably safe from everything, but its baby isn't. Mess with a rhino baby and you have its mum to answer to. This baby rhino is just being playful, but there's two tons of heavily armed, highly strung, overprotective parent right behind. Time to back off. Sometimes the calf comes running up to you and then she... If that calf runs to us now... Steady. <laughs> we are all going to die. But Ted was relaxed. He's an expert in rhino <laughs> psychology. The shorter the distance, the greater the, uh, the chance of a charge. Right. And if she charged, would it likely be a full charge, or would she mock charge us? She's start? not in the mood for charging. Hang on a minute. If we can just walk up to the rhino, even with a baby, and walk away unscathed, it can't really qualify as a deadly defender. Well, that's because these are white rhinos. White rhinos are far more calm and placid than their notoriously evil-tempered cousins, the black rhinos. So in my quest for the ultimate defenders, it was the black rhino we really needed to find. And Ted thought he knew where to look. One of the problems of rhino stalking like this is that the fairly chilled white rhino and the sometimes psychotic black rhino are pretty much the same color. The differences between the two are quite subtle. So, were we walking up on a black or white rhino? If it was white, no problem. If it was black, well... Run. Yep, it was black. The black rhino's got speed and a wicked temper, but it's got poor eyesight. So long as you're fairly fit and there's plenty of trees around, you can get away. Intimidating, but not an ultimate defender. It's too unfocused. As they say, power is nothing without control. I've just seen a really good sized crocodile slide into the water and I'm just trying to get a handle on where it is. Four meters in length, it could be four and a half. 
This animal is standing up, menacing, threatening, alert. I'm really not that comfortable being so close to him. It's one of the most chilling experiences I've ever had. A crocodile of this size could be 50 years old and would have no trouble taking an adult wildebeest or me. This is the closest I've ever been to lying alongside a dinosaur. The massive male makes for the surface. But simply takes a breath and heads straight back down towards us. It's coming after us. It's following us along the bottom. Big males battle to dominate their territories. He clearly sees us as a challenge. We've no choice but to risk a dash for the surface. was without a doubt the most frightening experience I've ever had with an animal. To avoid predators, he travels by night, a time when his eyesight comes into its own, but he also uses his impressive whiskers to build up a 3D picture. He uses sounds pitched above our hearing, and his super-sensitive nose analyzes every smell. He uses this information to create a sensory map that in the wild would guide him across kilometers of featureless desert. But his navigational equipment doesn't stop there. Wherever he goes, glands on his belly lay down a scent that acts like a paper trail, allowing him to retrace his steps back home. For a burrowing creature, holes are irresistible. In a hamster ball, he's astute enough to control the wretch. Although some aspects of our modern world are too challenging, even for this hamster. But his incredible senses can also get him out of trouble. Using high-pitched calls that we can't hear, he detects the drop by the sound of the returning echoes. 
Disaster averted, he continues his secret mission, one he must complete. Soon Bagani hears something. This time, it really looks like she's hunting. Has she blown it? I don't think so. She's beginning to make her way downwind. I think she's going to try an ambush. She's missed it. Swishing her tail like that shows she's frustrated. It's not a good start. The longer it takes to eat, the weaker she'll become, and the weaker she becomes, the harder it is to hunt. Herbivores have powerfully muscled hind legs that give them superlative acceleration. Invaluable if you're caught unawares. bring safety. The North American pronghorn is the second fastest sprinter on the planet, but over long distances it's the world champion. But all large herbivores have to be able to run fast. They run on tiptoe so that they cover more ground with each stride. Muscles are bunched at the top of the legs so that the limbs are streamlined. Some grazers flaunt their athleticism as if to say, I'm fit, so save your energy and pick on someone weaker. Cheetahs may be the fastest sprinters, but gazelles are better at dodging and jinking. Slim line legs, however, trip only too easily.
and having eyes on the side of your head so that you can't see directly forward can be catastrophic. Even so, herbivores manage to outmaneuver their enemies more often than you might suppose. and thrusting horns are formidable weapons. This mother is going to defend her fawn, come what may. A buffalo has incautiously strayed away from its herd. It surely can have no defense against a group of lions. But the rest of the herd have noticed. Faced with the threat of hundreds of tons of massed anger, the lioness turns tail. The male lion, however, seems unwilling to give up. Buffalo, with their heavy armament, have won this particular battle. But the war on the plains is a never-ending one.